Thank you for watching Conversations About Confinement, a collaborative webinar featuring presenters from the Arizona and Nebraska benches and administrative offices of probation, hosted by the Nebraska Court Improvement Project and moderated by Beth Osprich of the Pre-Child Justice Institute. Over to you, Beth. And Tracy, advance the slide. Appreciate that. Session one can be viewed at that link. And if I understand correctly, you have to, to be part of this group to be able to access that link. Tracy, is that correct? Yes, that is correct. Okay, that's what I like to hear, is I was correct. So let's move on to um, the, the, the purpose of today. We're going to be talking about objective risk assessment instruments. And then what we're really interested in is the conversation from the bench to hear from the judges in each of the jurisdictions, and then we're going to have a little discussion also about the alternatives to detention. So objective risk instruments is what our first topic is going to be, and um, just as a kind of a way of a framing, what we're talking about when we talk about risk assessment instruments, objective tools, we're really looking at, because risk has, a you know, people hear risk and they kind of sometimes think need, and they think risk of what, and high risk, low risk. In the JDI world, what we're talking about is two, 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 the two things on the screen that we're trying to define. What's the risk to the public? Is there a risk to the public? Is, the, the, is there a danger to society, to the community, if, if a youth would not be detained? And the time period that we're talking about, we're not talking about a risk to reoffend or a risk to not appear in court for their entire life. We're talking about during the pendency of their current case. So I think those are two important areas that we need to make sure that we're understanding when we're talking about risk in this JDAI world. Is the kid going to be a danger to the community if he's not detained or not going to come back for future hearings? So the FTA, that failure to appear, and the risk during the pendency of the case, not again for their entire life. I don't know if anybody wants to add anything to that, if I frame that the way that everybody's OK with that. So let's move on, and I think I pass the torch now to Monica and Michelle to talk about Nebraska's risk assessment instrument. Yes, thank you, Beth. This is Michelle Luders. And um, for those of you that maybe are new to the webinar, I work with the Administrative Office of Probation here in Nebraska. I am one of the two statewide JDA coordinators, and I also support our probation staff across the state um, who utilize our risk assessment instruments um, when making those decisions for detention. So today I want to start out talking with everyone about what we have going on in Nebraska as it relates to the risk assessment tool. Our tool is in its third um, generation of uh, being um, utilized. But most recently, we updated our tool back in 2013 with support from the Annie e. Casey Foundation. What we do um, in Nebraska is the intake tool is utilized when law enforcement contacts probation officers 24 hours a day, seven days a week for the purpose of a detention of a young person in Nebraska. This also includes when a young person has a warrant and um, law enforcement um, locates a young person. We have to use our risk assessment tool in that fashion as well. Um, in Nebraska, our tool has four different factors that we're considering or areas that we're evaluating when we uh, interview those young people. We're looking at what the most serious offense is when that young person was brought to the attention of law enforcement and probation. What is their current legal status? Are they currently involved with the system, um, whether they've just been cited, maybe they're already on probation, what that legal status looks like. We also evaluate what their risk to appear in court is or the risk to reoffend. So we're looking at how, do they have a prior history of having failure to appear warrants? Have they um, not shown up to court hearings in the past? And what does their, um, if you will, their history of getting citations in criminal um, activity in the past look like, and we do evaluate that over the past 12 months. Like that is said, we're not evaluating their entire lifetime because as kids age, hopefully they're um, growing out of some of those behaviors, so we look at the most recent 12 months and what that looks like. 
In addition to that, we also look at mitigating and aggravating circumstances that may be going on in that young person's life. So we also want to look at things that are going well, because sometimes there are some positive things that are going on with that young person and their family. And then we also have the opportunity to evaluate some of those things that aren't included in the tool, and those would be considered those aggravating circumstances um, that help us come to the decision of what that looks like. And after our officers, our intake officers review and they gather all the information, they score out the tool. And in Nebraska, our tool is broken down at different levels. And so if a young person scores 0 to 5 on the risk assessment instrument, or the RAI, um, the recommendation is that they should be released without restrictions, go back home with their parent, guardian, whoever that may be, um, and then they would go to court following um, the pr process that's set up in each local jurisdiction. From there, a young person could score a 6 to 9 on the risk assessment instrument, and that area is designated to um, be able to release the young person and put them on some type of an alternative to detention. And we'll talk about those a little bit more later on today, but we have an array of alternatives to detention that are available in Nebraska, but still that young person is not put in that secure detention location. And in Nebraska, we also have um, the breakdown from 10 to 11, and that in, um, in Nebraska is where we have our staff secure facilities. And in Nebraska, those facilities would be the Juvenile Justice Center in Sarpy County. And in Madison County, we have a wing of that facility that is staff secure. And then if a young person scores 12 and higher on the risk assessment tool, the recommendation then is for that young person to um, be placed in secure detention. Within that tool, probation officers or the intake officers do have the ability to um, override or underwrite the tool depending on the circumstances of that intake and what's going on with that young person and their family, which we, they could be bumped up um, to a higher level of supervision or a level, lower level of supervision, depending on what's going on. And as we move on to the next slide, we're going to talk a little bit about um, the confidence that we have with our tool here in Nebraska. So as I stated earlier, we just revamped our tool back in 2013. And we wanted to kind of see where we were as a state um, with the utilization of our tool, because we do have a statewide tool. And so we had a tool evaluated by the Juvenile Justice Institute through the University of Nebraska in Omaha back in 2015-16 um, by Dr. Ann Hoff. Um, that study um, included the time frames from September 1st of 2013 through August 31st of 2014. And during that time period, there was approximately 1,840 intakes that were completed statewide. What we found from that evaluation of the tool is that 91% of the young people that um, went through the risk assessment tool process had no new law violations. And 6.7% of the young people that were evaluated um, failed to appear. So relatively speaking, we had some really good success with the young people that were released without restrictions, they showed up to court for the most part, and they did not reoffend prior to going back in front of the judge. So those are really good results that we had from the evaluation of that tool, but we still struggle um, with overrides of our risk assessment tool. Um, and that was, that's one of the factors that we continue to work on in Nebraska is what can we do to help support um, our intake officers or probation officers when making those decisions and making sure that the courts and all the other community providers are comfortable with the tool as well. And I think this piece of data really shows that when we released young people, they showed up to court and they didn't reoffend prior to coming to court. Um, we do have this report available. Um, on the screen here, there's a link you can look at. And the full report there details out all the different findings of what was found during that evaluation process. So because of what we did with the evaluation of the tool, when we look at what our next steps are here in Nebraska, um, we are going to continue to use the risk assessment tool when we make those decisions for young people when they go into detention. One of the things that we are um, shifting to here in 2018, which should probably be going live by the time summer comes, is that all young people that are going into detention, um, whether it's a violation of probation, a new law violation, a warrant, what have you, um, the intake tool is going to be used to help um, guide our intake officers on making those detention decisions. It's not to say that detention won't be utilized for those young folks, 
but it's going to help us as we continue to evolve and make good decisions for young people as it relates to secure detention. And so I'm going to turn it now over to our Arizona folks, and they're going to talk a little bit about the tool that they utilize. Thank you. My name is Jen Ortiz, and I am two of two. Last week, you've met my partner, Angie Lopez, and she was one of one of the State of Arizona JDEI coordinators, and I'm the other half of that team. Today, I'm going to talk to you about Arizona's detention screening instrument, the DSI tool. We named it the DSI tool because we have a, another tool here in Arizona called uh, our ASIAS, which is a risk assessment instrument that is used to score kids on probation. We found that it caused confusion when we would talk about risk assessment instruments and people thought we were doing away with that tool, so that's why we call it the DSI. Currently, that tool is being field tested in six of our eight JDI counties. That was also intentional because we have some counties that were new to JDAI, and we felt that it was very important to field test it in our well-established JDI counties instead of having our newer counties field test the tool when they were still very new and getting the fundamentals of JDAI. Second, or third, my apologies, is our tools automated. We also have a paper version of the tool that we keep uh, updated. But as we know, automation could fail, so we might maintain a paper tool as well as the automated tool. The automated version of the tool is housed where we keep our ASIAS. We also uh, utilize the tool. It's requested for intakes by law enforcement and probation. If probation is scoring a, a kid, they will score the tool completely for things like probation violations or warrants or court orders, which fall under our special detention cases. The tool has scoring for the following categories, the most severe current offense, prior offense history, legal status and court history, aggravating factors, mitigating factors, and something I spoke about earlier was special detention cases. So if a kid comes in on a warrant, that's a special detention case, it's an automatic detention, a probation violation. However, if you are requesting a detention, a, a probation violation, you have to have supervisor approval to do so also court orders. <clears throat> Once the tool is completed and scored, there's three options that's provided. Zero to six would be released. Seven to 11 would be released in an unsecure option, and we'll talk about later when we talk about our alternatives here in Arizona. And 12 and above is the option to detain. Currently, the next steps for Arizona, we are going to have our tool is being validated. We're currently working through all of the data that we have collected uh, as we enter that information into our case management system, and it's being sent to 1 in 37 research to be validated. We are then going to train the rest of our counties. So what's important to know is the other nine counties, we're very grateful here in Arizona to only have 15 counties. I've learned through JDI that other states have like hundreds of counties, which is very, very um, overwhelming. So we only have 15. We're going to train our other counties on the, the tool, and they'll use it, and it'll be rolled out statewide. So regardless if you are a JDI county or not, Arizona will have a statewide tool. All right, Jen. Hey, thank you. Um, appreciate that from our comrades in Arizona. Um, one thing that I, I should have said also when we talked about the framing of a risk assessment is the tool, and I think this is really important to understand, has never been um, meant to be a substitute for professional judgment. It's supposed to help guide the decision, and it's supposed to inform the decision, but it's never supposed to, it never have been, it has been intended to take away uh, judicial responsibility or judicial decisions. We're going to talk now about alternatives because you can't expect kids to be released to an alternative with a certain risk assessment score if there are no alternatives. So the so two go hand in hand. So we're going to have a, now a, a discussion, and I think David from Arizona is going to lead us off on the discussion about alternatives. So, Jen, I'm sorry, but the camera's going to have to go to David. Good afternoon. So, yeah, um, as you heard about, Jen mentioned our tool, and they have scoring options. We have uh, 
obviously some alternatives here in the state. Um, we have alternative or assessment reception centers. Sometimes kids are brought to detention and then referred to some of their community uh, like reception centers like a, um, a Hope Center in Yuma County or the ACES Center in Pima County, which are designed to provide the kid with um, some services and feedback. It doesn't necessarily even have to have a referral, but in cases where law enforcement's brought them to detention, there usually is an accompanying referral, but they're handled in the community rather than through the detention center. Um, other counties are uh, releasing kids with the understanding that they will go to evening reporting centers until their hearing or until their court case. Um, and then uh, we also see, as you see at the top of the slide there, next day hearings. So we have expedited hearings um, for cases that uh, the, the worker at night uh, who gets the intake um, doesn't feel the kid needs to be detained. There's probably a very good chance that the judge is going to release him the next day. Rather than putting him through the trauma of getting detained and searched, sending them home to their parents with the promise to show up the next day at a hearing. Um, and that way the judge can make that decision the next day. So those are a few of the um, types of alternatives we offer here in Arizona. And uh, be happy for anyone who's interested to reach out to us or, or our counties to uh, share more information about those in the future. Thank you. So I think now Monica and Michelle are going to talk about some of the alternatives in Nebraska. Great, thank you, Beth. Um, this is Monica Miles Stephens, and I am the other part of the team. Uh, you met Michelle just a minute ago talking about our risk assessment instrument. We do have a broad continuum of um, alternatives to detention in Nebraska, ranging from very least restrictive. Often our probation officers are working with families to try to figure out are there other options, relatives, friends that they could maybe stay with until they're able to go to court the next day for their detention hearing. Um, all the way up to most restrictive in terms of um, an alternative to detention would be our electronic monitoring or our shelter placement options, which we know we um, have shelter in uh, Scott's Bluff, in Grand Island, in um, Lincoln, and in Omaha. So. We know that we don't have all alternatives in all different parts of the state. Um, that's something that we continue to work on in Nebraska, is helping counties develop um, continuums within their jurisdictions and within the judicial districts. One of the things that we've found to have some success with is partnering with communities and their community-based aid dollars. So that whether a youth is pre-adjudicated or whether a youth is already on, on probation and ends up with a new law violation, we try to partner with communities and service providers to have that seamless um, services. So we work with the provider that maybe will do electronic monitoring or tracking, and we work to have the same provider that does pre-adjudicated services as they do for our youth on probation so that if it, a youth gets adjudicated while at a hearing or something like that, we can make sure and just continue to use that provider and not have to switch providers with youth and families that can get confusing. The most recent um, alternative to detention that we have been partnering with is with our behavioral health regions and their rollout of crisis mediation or response. This started in um, Sarpy County in one of our JDAI sites as they looked at the data and knew that a lot of the youth that we were struggling with or overriding on our tool for were because they either parents were refusing to take kids home, um, the youth was refusing to go home, there was lots of frustration in the family. Not so much a public safety risk or that the youth was at risk of fleeing the jurisdiction. And so they worked with the behavioral health region um, to create a crisis mediation response. This is a partnership with law enforcement as well as this community provider. And then that's been going for now for two years. And um, they've had over 200 calls to law enforcement to go out and respond in situations like this where there's um, dysfunction or disruption in the home, whether it's a pre-adjudicated youth or a youth already on probation. And in those 200 calls, only two youth over the last two years have had to be detained. So this program was really the impetus for um, working with the system of care efforts that are going on around the state 
and working to ensure that all behavioral health regions are offering this crisis response opportunity. So if you're not familiar with that, I would encourage you to work with your local probation office and your local behavioral health region to get more information, or feel free to reach out to Michelle and myself. Our contact information will be at the end of the presentation, and we can connect you to the folks who are making that happen. Thanks, I Monica. Think now we're going to pass it off to the judges. From the bench, indeed we are. We're going to be led in the discussion by Judge Hockley and Judge Rowland. So I at first wondered who these judges were, if they were from Nebraska or from Arizona. I was told from neither. So I'll turn it over now to the judges. Okay, this is Judge Hockley. Uh, I'm in Pima County, Arizona. I've been involved with the JDAI process since 2003 when it first started. For those of you that haven't seen the last part of this webinar or the first part of it, I've been a defense attorney at juvenile court, I've been a prosecutor at juvenile court, and I've been a judicial officer at juvenile court, all taking place over the past 30 years. When JDAI first came to Pima County, I was with the county attorney's office, and I was the head of the county attorney's office. Uh, so I represented our elected official in regards to all things JDAI. The important thing as we looked at JDAI was the partnership we needed with the community and the other members uh, of the court community. Uh, we needed the county attorney's office together with our public defender's office. We had contract attorneys who, when the public defenders had a conflict, uh, were involved. Uh, we had the presiding judge leading the way and ensuring that we had food at every meeting. We had a number of the uh, com our community partners present as we discussed uh, how we were going to proceed and, and how we went through everything. Uh, what we learned from the process was that we didn't involve probation as much as we should have, and we've been working for the last 15 years to make up for that mistake. Um, it's helpful when we have somebody like uh, Sheila, my compadre here, uh, who is familiar with probation, now handling our JDAI coordinating because she can work within and uh, speak to both systems. Uh, the key part that we have is training and mentoring of our other judicial officers. Uh, we currently have a rotation process in place where we have approximately, well, we have 14 judicial officers. We have approximately four new judicial officers every year that we have to train on the JDAI as well as all the other factors, things that we do here at juvenile court. Um, so it's important that we start first with a mentor assigned to them that's familiar with JDAI and able to answer the questions. And secondly, to really work with um, training from all aspects of uh, JDAI, including our detention folks, our probation folks, uh, getting the input from both prosecution and defense, as well as other judges. We need to make sure that when we're in court and uh, we're not following a recommendation of probation when it comes for detention, perhaps there's a recommend, recommendation that a juvenile is, should be detained. And even though they may have scored 12 or higher on uh, the risk assessment instrument uh, or the detention instrument, uh, we can still release them. But I always make sure that when I am releasing a juvenile or the, over uh, the recommendation of probation, that I'm clear to validate the probation officer's recommendation. For example, uh, to the youth, I would explain how the recommendation is to keep detained. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and give you this opportunity that you're asking for. I'm expecting you to follow these conditions to the letter um, and uh, encourage them to do that, but also remind them that uh, probation's recommendation was as good a recommendation as releases. And then it's important to know who the key players are that uh, you are working with within the system. Uh, and those are all those that I've discussed earlier that are part not only of our collaboration, but of our court family. Okay.
with our uh, group and Judge Roland, you, you can pop in any anywhere in here that you'd like, but here in Pima County, we'll have uh, placement staffings to determine whether somebody we've had detained or uh, for a period of time, or even if it's an overnight uh, detainment, we may get some recommendations from our placement committee, uh, giving us places to uh, potentially alternatives to those placements. Uh, we have to work with our behavioral health community in regards to some of those placements, which I think is probably our biggest struggle, but they continue to communicate with us and we continue to improve uh, that process. We need to always be open to the new opportunities and relationships that we can make in the community. Some of the alternatives that we had at the beginning of this process are no longer around, but we've been able to collaborate with others to come up with new and what I would consider better alternatives. It's always a process in motion, and you should always have uh, your eyes open to any potentially new opportunities. Uh, need to make sure that we have the correct partners uh, working with us. Uh, Metro is an organization that we work with that's affiliated with uh, Goodwill. Um, it helps with some of our kids and can give us some alternatives by encouraging the kids to participate in the programs that Metro has, uh, as well as with the IF project. With our different work groups, we try and get the feedback from uh, those different work, group, work groups uh, about alternatives, about how things are working, not working, what can we do to improve them. You have to remember, you can't be offended when someone's criticizing a program. You have to be open to everything. Listen to all the ideas. Uh, it's amazing what even some of our Youth Advisory Council comments have been that, that really get us thinking, well, maybe we could do this a little bit different here or a little bit different there so we have less of a traumatic impact upon those juveniles that are, are with us. And then pay attention to, we speak with other judges, get their perspective. We have had judges that uh, were not on board with the JDAI process and it took some work talking to them and even though they never wanted to admit that they were on board with JDAI, you could see from the different rulings they were uh, making that they were actually following the principles and meeting and the issues that we had brought up with them. And then always uh, listen to your county attorney and your public defender's perspectives. Uh, they, at least in Pima County, are very familiar with the JDI process, familiar with the alternatives, and sometimes come up with alternatives of their own. And as judicial officers, we need to be open to anything and everything that comes up. Sure. Just in the last few years, I've seen some big changes with the way probation is handling the detentions. Um, a few years ago, uh, I had a case where it was a very serious allegation against a young man. Uh, probation did their intake, uh, and it was primarily based on the score received for the charge being filed that they were placed in detention. Uh, unfortunately, the officer really didn't look anything beyond that, uh, and we did have a uh, detention hearing uh, the day, day or second day after the placement, uh, and it was very frustrating to hear uh, what had taken place in the decision. Um, that has changed a lot at least out in my area. Um, just over the last weekend, I had an 11-year-old boy hold a knife on his mom in the home and another person there, uh, and uh, probation uh, removed the home, but rather than placing him in detention, you know, uh, 300 miles across the state, uh, they placed him at the shelter in Scotts Bluff. We had a hearing Monday afternoon. Uh, his mother was there with the probation officer as well as a guardian ad litem. Uh, his attorney was in Sydney, uh, where we had the hearing where it was based out of, um, and we were able to place the child back home with services. So there are options. Communication is the key, uh, and collaboration on working together. Go ahead, Judge Hockley. Thank you. Additional things I wanted to say. I was uh, impressed when they were talking about the risk assessment instrument there in Nebraska, and that you need to remember when you're looking at whether to release or detain a juvenile, that only seven out of 100 kids uh, failed to appear, actually a little bit less than uh, seven, although I'm not sure exactly how you have a partial kid. Um, 
that also that only nine out of 100 committed a new offense. I, we didn't have any information in regards to how serious those offenses were. But I think what you want to remember is, do I want to detain the other 93 kids because it's possible this kid's not going to appear? So you should have some pretty strong evidence, in my opinion, before you're going to go ahead and detain for a failure to appear, uh, because generally speaking, they show up. And a lot of times what you'll find is, and what I've started doing is ordering parents to make sure those kids get to court. Um, in some cases, if the kid has missed a few times, you take a look, it's really the parent not making sure that there's transportation available to get that kid to court. And we shouldn't be detain detaining someone because their parent is not meeting their parental uh, responsibilities. This slide, is we're talking a little bit about the challenges to length of stay because we end up having juveniles detained for longer periods of time than we would want. Some of the issues that uh, I run into include the coordination of calendars with 14 judicial officers, public defender's office, the contract attorneys, the county attorneys, uh, plus uh, judicial calendars that are dealing with dependencies because we do both the dependencies and the delinquencies. It's hard to find time on our calendars. I get a little frustrated when I have uh, defense counsel saying, well, judge, you need to get this done in a timely manner and then proceed to tell me when they can't show up. So I will remind them um, at times that perhaps they're the issue with getting something coordinated with the calendar and that ultimately um, we need to get this taken care of. Uh, we've had issues with continuances and youth remaining in detention because of the disclosure time, uh, timely, untimeliness. Uh, county attorney's office not getting the disclosure. Uh, I'll enter orders giving them deadlines in regards to that. Uh, sometimes they uh, will meet the deadlines. Other times we'll just go forward with what they have and they're not going to have anything else to present. Usually uh, they'll just dismiss without prejudice until they have everything together, but at least then we don't have a juvenile waiting in detention when there's really not sufficient disclosure taking, uh, taken care of. We get frustrated with the continuances, as we all do, and that's just a matter of holding people accountable and not just have them come in, as I've seen attorneys when I was a prosecutor do before from the defense side come in and say, oh, Judge, I need a continuance. Can you give me a couple of weeks? Well, why do you need a continuance? Uh, why haven't you had an opportunity to meet with your client? What's the issue? And sometimes it's a matter, again, of ordering the parents to get the child to the attorney's office or to the appointment, wherever it might be, to meet with uh, counsel. And then the placement delays, which for us is generally the behavioral health system, as I mentioned earlier. We're working with them, trying to get that taken care of. Uh, the behavioral health system ends up paying for a lot of our placements, but there are times where we as the juvenile court, we have our own treatment budget, and we'll go ahead and make placements of juveniles on our dime, so to speak, because it's the right thing to do and we can't wait on the behavioral health network. Or when we believe strongly and our psychologists are telling us level one placement, which is the most secure placement, needs to happen, but behavioral health thinks that level two, which is not a secure placement, which a juvenile can walk away from uh, any time uh, that they wish, uh, when the behavioral health thinks that that's appropriate, uh, I will go ahead and order level one if I feel strong, strongly about that. And then you need to make sure that we have participation uh, from uh, the parents, guardians. For us, it's Department of Child Safety. For other places, it's CPS if they're involved with the juvenile. We need them to be present at the hearings, uh, and we need to, them to be involved with uh, treatment in terms of making sure that the opportunity is there for the youth to get to the treatment and to participate in the treatment. I don't hesitate either ordering parents to do certain things if they need, need be, or guardians, or even DCS caseworkers. Uh, and then finally, some of the issues we have uh, to, with DCS separately is uh, transportation uh, becomes unreliable when you have a juvenile that's placed in a group home or even with some foster homes. DCS is responsible for transportation of those youth that are in the system. Uh, and I've had to enter some orders there. And uh, in the past, have had DCS workers that I've had to bring into court for contempt 
uh, hearings because of their failure to make sure that those things are happening. Judge Rowland, anything you want to add? Okay. I, I, um, yeah, I think a lot of times when we're uh, dealing with the transportation issue, uh, we'll order uh, transportation uh, is to be provided uh, on occasion if we're going across the state uh, where a child is placed, we'll even order the parents be provided with transportation uh, for visitation uh, and occasionally lodging, but that can be an issue. And if you address it up front, uh, if your guardian ad litem, your prosecutor, your defense attorney are all on the same page and cover that right away, it, it can go very seamless. But it can be frustrating here. We're dealing with attorneys that are appearing sometimes in eight courtrooms throughout the week uh, in eight different counties uh, and trying to coordinate schedules. That's why we set the hearings right at the first detention hearing. So uh, we're going to come back for admission or denial uh, maybe a week or so after that first hearing. And we're also setting the adjudication date, preferably within 30 days of the removal. Um, so everybody's got their calendar. We've got the schedule, and we're ready to go. Um, the continuances get frustrating when you come to one of the adjudications and they just assume that it's going to be okay to be continued. So um, you just kind of want to set the ground rules right up front. Uh, if that's not going to be allowed, absence of emergency, that's not going to be allowed and be ready sure to go. Make sure that you maintain the Thank dignity you. of the courtroom and maintain the schedules for the benefit of the, uh, of the juveniles. Um, when people tend to forget things, we need to make sure that they go ahead and Remember that we're talking about youth that are detained and that they have rights and that we need to make sure that those uh, rights are taken uh, taken seriously. We'll also, I, I consider telephonic appearances, whether it be for the parent, in some cases the juveniles, if they're in a placement someplace, um, uh, if we're holding, if they're not detained and we need to have them present. Um, if a parent is going to be someplace else but can appear telephonically, for example, at work, uh, let's do that. Let's do everything we can to accommodate uh, those folks. I've even had, in some instances, where I've had to have an attorney appear uh, by phone, uh, but that's what's best for the juvenile. We're able to move forward rather than uh, continue it. Uh, we have guardian ad litems that get appointed uh, for some of the juveniles in cases. And if there's a calendar conflict for them, I don't hesitate to waive their attendance as long as they provide me and all the parties with a written position um, because they, they have their own track that they can proceed on that doesn't necessarily have to track the delinquency aspect of things. And then when we have juveniles that are detained and we're waiting for placement, I will request weekly updates. Uh, some probation officers, I know that I have to set it for a hearing in order to get the update and other probation officers I know are on top of it and will just email out to all the parties with a copy to the court so that we know what's happening. And then if we need to have a hearing set, we'll set an accelerated hearing uh, to handle any of those different things. If I have, for me, uh, finally with behavioral health providers, which I keep bringing up because I see that as one of my biggest issues, when they're denying certain services, for example, uh, what I was talking about with the level one versus the level two, I don't have the ability to order them to do anything except I can order them to come into court and tell me why they're making a decision that they're making or not making a decision. And what I found is that most of the time, uh, well over majority of the time, if I order them to come into court, for some reason, five minutes before they walk into court, they have resolved the issue and they're willing to go ahead and do what it is that we've been asking them to do. So I find that as a very uh, effective uh, tool working with my behavioral health um, folks. Uh, a couple of the other things that I just wanted to touch on uh, were, you know, we can look at double booking hearings if necessary. We can explore other judges covering for us uh, when necessary. Also explore whether there's other attorneys that can cover, for example, if it's the public defender's office and it's more of a hearing that we're setting, hearings they can prob probably get coverage. Uh, but I leave that up to them. I don't order them to get 
other coverage because I know sometimes they've built a relationship with the with the juvenile that's important for that attorney to always be present. Judge Rowland? I agree with that. And just to hit on the uh, telephonic appearances, especially when you're talking about a detention hearing the day after the uh, youth has been detained, um, we absolutely allow people to appear by telephone. Um, if the youth is actually at a detention facility, uh, we can't afford nor logistically get them back to actually appear for that hearing. Uh, so we use uh, the webcam. Uh, our detention facilities here in Nebraska, uh, as well as even the probation offices, have access to that. Uh, and uh, we certainly allow that to happen on a regular basis. Uh, I talked about ordering guardian or DCS or whatever to be present. What I really wanted to emphasize with this slide is that even as judicial officers, we can be thinking outside of the box and get probation thinking outside of the box. I've had the cases where probation comes in and they're, they're, they, ha they have that tunnel vision, this is what I think should happen. And we're not getting the help from behavioral health or there's other people that disagree with that. And I've had at times uh, talked to the probation officer on the record with everybody present and said, okay, what are the alternatives? We need to be looking at some other things. Defense counsel has recommended this program. Have you looked into that program? Why haven't you looked into that program? And if need be, order them to look into that program. Uh, but as you create a dialogue with the probation officer, I find that suddenly a couple of other ideas come up. Uh, and we have to remember that um, as good as they are, sometimes they get focused on a program they think is going to be best. But I think we all know that the one size doesn't fit all, that what works for this juvenile isn't necessarily going to work for that juvenile, and we've got to be open to looking at uh, other alternatives. Um, I think I've pretty well talked about the other aspects of this slide when we previously talked. Judge Roland, anything you want to add? Just one other thing. That, yeah, one other point I would make is don't forget about the mediation centers also. Uh, especially when you're you're coming down and you're trying uh, basically struggling to come up with options sometimes getting that mediator getting everyone around the table uh, can help facilitate coming up with a good plan so just another option that's out there and I know we wanted to have some time for discussion so I'll cut it off there so I invite other um, judges that might be on the call if they have any questions or any um, ideas that they want to contribute to this discussion We'll give you a few minutes to think about questions that you might have. We're going to go ahead and move on and just give you the opportunity in a couple minutes. But we're going to talk a few slides, just a couple minutes, Sheila and Monica, about the changing culture um, in probation, for probation. So again, I encourage those that are participating, if they have Thank you. questions, um, think about I'm we'll Sheila Kemble. I'm the JDAI coordinator and, here in Pima County, wow, Arizona. And I actually was on board thoughts. when we first Sheila? started our JDAI efforts. And as Judge Hockley referenced earlier, um, probation wasn't really included in that process. And what we found from that is that it was really challenging um, to get probation buy-in to JDAI given that they weren't included in that. And so we're still trying to really work around that um, and educate the staff that has been here since the inception of JDAI, um, get them involved in it to have a, a greater understanding of what JDAI is about. And um, we've had some success with that, but we still need to continue to engage them. Um, what we've started recently doing is providing educational opportunities for officers, um, and especially with new officers coming on board, making sure that they understand what JDAI is and how that impacts the work that they're doing, and most importantly, how what they do impacts um, the positive outcomes that we want to see for the youth that we work with. Um, so really one of the biggest emphasis that I have on the rollout of JDAI was the making sure that the boots on the ground, so to speak, are really included in that process and educated on JDAI to ensure that they're on board with it and that what they're doing is in line with the JDAI uh, core strategies. Um, one of the things that we also do is provide uh, daily detention updates. 
So every day, all supervisors within probation and then some other uh, people around the court get a daily update on who's in detention, uh, what their risk level is. It's sorted out by age, race, and ethnicity. And so every day there's a clear snapshot of who we have in detention. Uh, and looking at that to see if there's areas that are becoming elevated. For example, at one point probation violations were our greatest number in detention. Um, and so we really did some intentional work around that. Um, and kind of elevated this, the requirements for staffing um, of youth that probation officers wanted to detain um, and put some more oversight over that. And um, once we saw that there was a, sh a shift in the behaviors, um, a shift in the numbers, then we, we kind of decreased those requirements um, for that oversight. What we've noticed is that now we see an elevated number of warrants in detention. And so now we're really looking at those to identify why we see that um, increase and the decrease in probation violations. So just that constant oversight, looking at trends and, and how we can impact those. Um, we've really made some shifts in our hiring process as well. Um, wanting to make sure that new probation officers coming on board um, are really in, in line with the JDAI philosophy. Um, we want to make sure that people are coming on board who don't view this um, job as a punitive job. They're not law enforcement and that they're really here um, understanding that our goal is to help youth be successful. Um, so in the interview processes, we really look at um, questions um, in the process that surround evidence-based practice um, that are in line with motivational interviewing, which is something we require of all our officers, um, and that they're really looking to build relationships with the youth because we know that that's how youth can be successful, is if the officer has formed a relationship. And even that can be confusing to some officers at times who um, misunderstand that we're saying you need to become their friend. And it's not that, it's that you're going to see better outcomes and the youth and families are going to engage more effectively with the officer if there's a relationship there. And it's not just probation officer um, versus youth and family, which is sometimes how they feel. And so we really want to make sure the officers are focusing on the accomplishments of these youths, the strengths, and not so focused on the negative aspects and what they've done wrong, but what have they done right and how can we help move them forward in a positive way. Um, Monica, did you have anything to add to that? So unlike in Arizona, um, probation is actually, and the court administrator's office has been the lead on our JDI work in Nebraska. Um, it started with Corey Steele, who is now the court administrator, um, and JDI came to Nebraska in 2011 in Douglas County through um, leadership with Judge Daniels, and then spread to Sarpy County, um, and there Judge O'Neill and Judge um, Gendler are the co-chairs of their collaborative, and then Judge O'Neill helped spread the initiative to Odo County, where he hears, um, he hears cases down in Odo County, and now our fourth site has just come on board in Lancaster County through the um, work with Judge Heideman and Judge Ryder and their um, efforts to bring the work there. So we, and then Michelle and I helped staff the um, statewide collaborative, which is chaired by Corey Steele, the court administrator, and now Senator Vargas. Um, so it's been a little bit opposite experience in Nebraska where probation is trying to work with all of our other providers and, and stakeholders to help um, bring this philosophy and these concepts to those efforts across the state. Um, just like in Arizona, I'll mention a couple of things that we're doing internally in probation um, to help change our culture. And like you said, Sheila, one is that um, in most districts, you should be getting either a daily or a weekly list from probation of what youth you have in detention or and or out of home placement. And internally, um, we look at that list weekly and have set some policies around um, really helping elevate the, the understanding and urgency around youth in short term placement like detention or shelter and how we aren't really getting much for those placements, but we need to be moving youth on to the right place, um, whether that's back home or to the treatment that they need. 
So once a youth is in detention for 10 days, our office, it triggers a process where our officers have to develop a short-term transition plan, and they staff that with their supervisor. And those plans are required every seven days um, until that youth has moved on to where they need to go. So that's something that we've done internally. Um, we also see a lot of warrants, and so that is also a priority for us as we move forward. And a lot of our districts have started um, having officers staff of those situations with their supervisors before they issue a warrant to make sure, have we tried other alternatives? Have we um, exhausted what efforts before we need to issue that warrant? We do require a supervisor approval to override any time on our tool. Um, and we are really trying to work on broadening the um, alternatives to detention. And our, we're collaborating with Court Improvement Project. They'll be sending out a survey to the judges um, here in the very near future to just find out what kinds of services and, and options are you still needing and what would be helpful to you in terms of working the youth that, and families that you see. So we would love your feedback on any other kinds of alternatives um, that you think would be helpful. Um, I think that covers my list. Oh, and the last thing that's coming up in conjunction with Michelle mentioned earlier about um, us doing the, our RAI tool on all probation violations is the rollout of um, our LB8 and our graduated response matrix. And that will be coming out hopefully this summer as well with a whole new way of looking at um, graduated response and really looking at incentives as well as um, and a balance of sanctions and looking at those sanctions being very um, informed by adolescent uh, development and intentional and swift. Um, we've had our folks from the NEKC Foundation